Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Hashtag Clocked In with me, your host, Jordan Edwards. I'm thrilled to have you tune in as we dive into the dynamic world of productivity, success, and stories of incredible individuals who've mastered the art of getting things done. Whether you're commuting, hitting the gym, or just relaxing at home, this podcast is the go-to source for inspiration and actionable tips to level up your productivity game. I'm on a mission to unravel the secrets of those who seem to effortlessly manage their time and achieve their goals. So if you're ready to clock in and unlock your full potential, you're in the right place. We've got a lineup of amazing guests, industry experts, and thought leaders who will share their insights and strategies to help us crush your to-do list and make the most out of every moment. Get ready to get inspired, motivated, and equipped with the tools you need to supercharge your productivity. This is Hashtag Clocked In with Jordan Edwards. Let's dive in. Hey, what's going on, guys? I've got a special guest here. We have Devin Sony. He's an experienced operations executive and investor. He spent several years of his, as a technology-focused investor at Goldman Sachs and Highland Capital Partners. We invested over $200 million, wow, in, technical, in technology growth and venture deals as a private equity investor. Devin has a deep experience with asset de- uh, digitalization, co-founded Wire Investors, a tech-focused buyout that acquired 12 different businesses between 2015 and 2017. Now he's the CEO of Matador Gold Technologies. Devin seeks to disrupt and modernize the gold buying process by creating an easy to access audited platform for anyone to secure their savings and avoid wealth destroying effect of inflation. Wow. Devin, we are going to dive into Matador. How are you doing today? Uh, doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Jordan. Yeah, this has been something that I found really fascinating when I was speaking with your team, um, just about how you've, you've had a pretty incredible career. Now, where did that career start for you? Um, so, you know, I, I grew up in Chicago um, and, you know, the family moved, like got tired of snow and, and moved to the Bay Area in, in, in California uh, when I was about 12 years old. Um, you know, this was in the 90s, just kind of right at the beginning of kind of the tech boom. And, you know, l- l- like everybody else at the time and place, um, you know, kind of fell into technology, um, went, went to college at, at UC Berkeley in the Bay Area. Um, and, and just realized really quickly that I, I actually w- was much more of like a like a finance person than a, than a computer science person. I think it was partially just doing, you know, courses with them. Um, you ever go to these classes and, you know, you, you do the final exam and then people would like finish this thing in like four minutes and you haven't written your name. You're like, what is going on here? That was me in my computer science classes. And then the other, uh, you know, it ended up being like the other way around of like finance and accounting and economics. I just realized that was kind of my, my strong suit. Um, you know, fell into investment banking uh, right after college, worked at a firm called Lazard, which is kind of this small boutique, you know, storied firm. But we, our, our clients were companies like Microsoft and Amazon, and, and, and we would help them, you know, buy, buy businesses. So that was kind of my, my first role out of college and living in the Bay Area, you know, working 80 hours a week. Uh, just got, got used to have it, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's a fun one. Yeah. Investment banking is no joke. And do you think that going that investment banking path was something that growing up in San Francisco where everyone is a tech founder or everyone has the new startup or everyone's got some idea that kind of pushed you in that direction? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, in a lot of ways, like working in finance, um, like M&A or, or, or investing, it's kind of like, you know, you know, it's entrepreneur speed dating. You just get to meet so many people. You go from like meeting to meeting, you get to hear their life story. It's all these people that you have no business being in the room with as a, you know, a 21 or 22 year old kid. Um, so that was like really, really, um, you know, inspiring to me. But I think I also just realized really quickly, like, I've always been this sort of person. It's like never like just fully happy or satisfied in the present. Like you can start meditating or something, but, but, you know, you'd always like meet people and you're like, well, like, I kind of want to be more like this guy at the other side of the table. Cause I'm the one that's sitting here, you know, working on a PowerPoint presentation at two in the morning while they're, you know, off doing whatever on their private planes. And, you know, so like, I, I think I, I, banking was great. It was, it was an opportunity to kind of build credibility, meet a lot of great people, see what the world is like in it you know, like a, like that speed dating fast forward format. But I, I think I realized pretty quickly that I wanted to be on the other side of the table. Got you. Got you. So you were ready to settle down with the relationship as meaning like starting a company. Or a lot of relationships, you know, <laughs> 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 I think it's a fallout, right? But like, I, I guess I wanted to be, I, I want to, you know, wanted to be, uh, 
a part of the relationship, not the the person, you know, kind of mopping the floors after, the, you know, whatever. Like, no, I mean, that that's a good learning experience. And what was your way out of that? How did you make that decision to go, I'm done with investment banking, I'm ready for the next activity? Did you jump into a startup or what was that path like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think the two things I, I learned in my first kind of couple of years of investment banking you know, thing number one was I, I literally didn't know anything about anything, right? Like, uh, other than making some spreadsheets and PowerPoints look pretty. Uh, and, and the second one was, um, you, you know, at, at some point I wanted to, you know, sort of like own companies. I just realized that I think, really yeah, really. Um, and not even like work at companies, you see, companies that like owning companies was was the thing that really made sense to me. Um, but because of that, I, you know, I ended up we had been pitching this company for a bunch of years. That was this brilliant, you know, fast growing unicorn of a business when I was in banking, ended up joining that company, um, you know, working directly with the, the CEO and the CFO. Um, it was this company that grew from like 30 people when I started to 300 in a year or two. Oh, wow. Um, you know, like a rocket ship or, you know, it was a unicorn before they were called those things. Right. And it, it grew about a yeah. billion dollars in a couple of years. And uh, that company was eventually sold to a private equity firm. And I kind of got the, the front seat view of, um, you know, the entrepreneurs kind of building that business day in and day out. Um, just the way they, they spoke to people, the way they thought about their business, the way they, you know, interacted with like, you know, vendors and investors and things like that. So that was a really, really good experience for me. Um, and, you know, the company exited and eventually moved over to um, the buy side, which in like finance parlance is, is actually making direct investments. So investing, you know, directly in, um, you know, private, like in startups, in private equity firms, buying out public companies. So I basically joined Goldman Sachs at that point to help them invest in, in digital businesses mostly. Wow. Uh, that previous one that was the quote unquote startup. It, it's funny because when most people think of a startup, they're like, yeah, I'm going to quit my job and I'll start uh, selling books or selling something. Instead, yeah. you just hit, hit your wagon to some rocket ship that was already going in a great direction. And yeah, it was, it was you know, right, right place. That. Yeah, right place, right time. Got got lucky. It's, it's, again, it's, it's one of the benefits of, of, of seeing a lot, speed dating a lot, right? You you, you realize you, you know what separates great companies from companies that are just kind of floundering. And and I think uh, I, I found one that I just saw. You know, all the all the tailwinds were in the right direction, right? It was basically the company was called Next Tag, which isn't around anymore. But um, but basically, what it did was it really invented sort of like online advertising arbitrage. So if you think about oh, wow. Um, you know, searching for, um, you know, best price for like a digital camera or how to, you know, how to get the best home mortgage or something. They would, you know, basically create a bunch of content on these and then take people to these pages that would get them to click off, uh, the, you know, the page. It's very commonplace now, right? It's like affiliate marketing more or less, but really that, that company kind of built a lot of infrastructure. What year was that? I'm going to date myself. This is uh, 2004. To oh, so this is like in the early part of the internet. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. well, that, that early. <laughs> like early enough. Yeah, like you know, you know, right when people started getting broadband and stuff. I think. Yeah, absolutely. So then you make the jump. At, so after they went public, you left and then went to Goldman, or how out of that? Yeah, yeah. So they they sold. You know, they sold to a, a big private equity firm. It was basically like a full on exit, and and from there, I, I was kind of helping with that exit, and I basically you know saw the writing on the wall that it made sense for me to kind of do the next thing. And basically a, a couple of people I'd worked with in the past um, in investment banking had kind of moved over to the investing side at Goldman. Uh, it was just a really natural fit for me to kind of pop over there. Um, and, and, you know, I had a, a pretty good combination of, you know, being a spreadsheet monkey and PowerPoint monkey, which is kind of half the job, but also starting to really understand, you know, kind of high growth technology companies. Uh, so it, it made sense for me to kind of start helping them invest in those types of companies as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I, I know when a lot of people have that fear, like as we're in the recession now, people have that fear of what do I do for my next job? Where do I go? So it's good that you like networked out, got to speak with different individuals, understood what was out there and jumped in that direction. Yeah, it's funny though, you know, the, the truth of it, like to be honest, right? If, if I kind of go back to my, my, my head back then was that I think I still, even then wanted to be an entrepreneur, wanted to branch out. Um, but I think I probably just like didn't have the, the the sea legs or the confidence yet, which is why I kind of like, you, you know, like 
working in certain sectors like like finance and you're sort of on this like track right and the minute you of fall course. off the track it's like really really hard to get back on so i wasn't sure if i was ready to like jump off the roller coaster just yet or jump off the train and then you know sort of be on the outside looking in and i just don't think i had that confidence back then which is part of the reason i, I went to another firm versus you know starting my own thing to, to you know like yeah it, it, it all sounds like a like a path on paper when you look at it in the back in, in, you know like backwards but when i was thinking about it, i'm like man, I really don't want to, you know, I really don't want a job. I want to go start something, whatever. And, you know, but there's this great job, you know, it's like high six figures a year. I'm like, what, what do I do? And then I, I ended up spending a couple more years working and which, which I think was the right decision at the end because I still didn't know anything at the point, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's so true because when you say it like that, like Steve Jobs said it, uh, you can't connect the dots going forward. You can only connect them going back and you just can hope that that occurs. And usually when you look back, it does. But when you're in that exact moment, you go, what am I doing? Like, I, yeah. This is not where I want. And it's good to see that like someone as successful as yourself was like, I didn't really want to do that. Like, this is a, like, we always have that differing opinion because sometimes you feel like we're unique, but it's very commonplace that we have this. No, it's like the human condition, right? Like I remember very distinctly showing up the first day at the office, like 8 a.m. in the morning, wearing my suit, being like, what's here, man. <laughs> like, you know, it's great. Everyone's excited to see you. And it's like a great job. You know, all your, all, you know, every year friends or whatever, but I'm like in, in the back of my head, it's just a little voice telling me like, you know, I should be, you know, out there building stuff. So. Absolutely. And how has that purpose or how has that got, kind of got into your life? Um, you know, I think, uh, and you know, right before we, we started the interview or started recording, you were saying, hey, man, it's like, how old are you? So you look like you've done a lot of stuff, right? Like, and to me, um, I, I think the, the the guiding purpose for me has been, I try to learn as much as possible wherever I am. I try to be an absolute sponge. Um, and, and what that often turns into is I'll learn, you know, it's like the 80-20, right? I'll learn 80% of what I need to know, like in the first year or two. And for me, it had always been kind of this onwards and upwards, right? Like once I feel like I'm stagnating, um, you, only, you, only got, you only got one life uh, to live. So I've, I've always tried to, um, you know, move on to something where I'm like challenged. I, you know, it's like you said, like, well, why don't you just sit on a beach all the time? I, I just, you know, I think you just, if I'm a little, unless I'm a little uncomfortable, like I'm just not at peace, right? Like I need to be doing something I don't know or don't understand. Otherwise it's just like too easy. Yeah, I, I love that because they've actually talked about it. with people. It's very interesting because they've talked about it. Like if you retire, they're like the most people end up passing away like six years later. And yeah. it's such a random thing. And it's like, how does that even make sense? Because we're built to work. We're built to grow. And what people's association to work is, is always very interesting to me. Because it's like, it doesn't have to be something you like or don't like, but you can create whatever life you want to create. And that's, and that's why you're on because it's awesome seeing you create that life that you choose because you look for that next challenge look for what's motivating you but the real really the currency is through learning yeah no absolutely there's this is really interesting um like seneca quote which i'm going to butcher the actual exact quote but the punchline is you know uh, if you really want to see you know what, what the worst thing in, in the world would be just go you know live with a really meager means for a while right go go live in a you know without a bed or you know without a lot of money for food and you, you realize it's like really not that bad so if you're just terrified of this thing that that's really not that bad. I think it, it, it motivates you to try to do more with your life. And, and you know, th th that, that certainly has been always motivating to me. It's like, what's the, you know, what's the end of the world? Go, go move back in with my parents or something, right? Which not everyone has the opportunity, but, I, you know, it's like not, not the end of the world. Yeah. And that is absolutely true where you're like, if I'm going to cut the cord, it's all going to be cut. Like yeah. there is no issues. And it, I think it's really dropping that humility of going, I can downsize my house. I can downsize the car. I need to find a life that you love instead of being like, oh, my friends are going to judge me. It's like, no, find what you want to do. Enjoy your life, um, which is awesome. So after the Goldman, how was that experience? Yeah, no, it was, it was amazing. Um, I, I learned a ton from, again, it was just like one of those, like why, you know, I should not be in the same room as these people. You know, we made, you know, we looked at early stage investments, made some pass on some, like, you know, met, um, you know, Mark Pickett started Zynga in the room and he was like seeding the company, right. Or, or early stages of like, yeah, they were like funny. We're sitting wow. there brainstorming with them uh, about how to, how to, you know, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. It just, you know, with, with a lot of really, really 
and, and some of these folks today, like a lot of the people I dealt with that are like billionaires now in, in, in various forms, right? Uh, so that was a lot of fun. I think being part of a juggernaut uh, like Goldman, where um, you just realize that they're, it's, it's like this company built to make money more or less, right? And in every facet and not lose money and mitigate risk. So that was a, you know also great. And, and thirdly, I'm not going to lie, I think just being, uh, you know, cutting the cord eventually, having the, like the, the, the pedigree, the resume or whatever, definitely has made a lot of doors open up more easily. So uh, I'll, I'll end, you know, no, uh, you know, no, no regrets about, about the path, right? In hindsight. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense because you had the boutique, you had the startup that went public, and then you had the corporate one, which is all well-rounded, but it gives you that perspective to be like, it's my time. Yeah. And yeah, it, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> No, yeah, but, yeah, basically that. from there, you know, it was when I, I kind of was like, finally, you know, had a little bit more savings, had, you know, the economy was like, not, not so great. So I was like, okay, well, this is probably a good time as ever to, to go start on my own, which is kind of what I did right around, right, you know, right around then. So what year was that that you jumped? Yeah, um, it was sort of, you know, 2008, 2009, um, okay. that window. So um, yeah, 2009. Gotcha. And would you, when you left, was it, what was, was there a startup in hand? Were you looking for your next direction? What was, what was it really for you? Well, uh, you, you know, I think the two things it's, it's sort of, you know, when, when opportunity meets preparation or, or, or of like course, yeah. right. Um, so I've been living in kind of the internet economy for so long, um, you know, mobile and, and like the iPhone and just kind of starting to launch. Like, so that was becoming a big thing. Um, but at the same time, you know, for me, just being some, you know, at the end of the day, like some, some kids in the Midwest, um, uh, with a lot of pedigree, whatever, uh, I, I just thought it was really, I, I thought the numbers being thrown around in the world I lived in was just didn't, were like nonsensical, right? Like, like there'd be okay. startup companies that would be formed three weeks ago and they have some hype and they'd be valued at like $70 million pre-money. And, and then you sort of like start doing the math and I'm like, what? in the world to like $70 million, like actually buy you, right? I know it's an artificial yeah. construction valuation, but it's like, what does that actually buy you? And you realize, well, look, it could buy me, you know, 10% of a company with like, with, you know, two, two guys and a dog and a spreadsheet or, you know, a real operating business that generates like real meaningful cash flow and stuff like that. So I, I kind of wanted to meld this interest in, um, um, you know, kind of like a value and in investing in earnings and like real business with, you know, the technology wave that had been happening in the last 10 or 20 years. And I kind of found this really weird niche, right? And, and, and when I was in it, it was really weird. Now it's just only a little weird, right? It's, it's basically, you know, buying small, profitable kind of businesses. So, um, they, you know, I think literally the first thing I bought was just like, I think it was called like TekkenForums.com. It was like a forum for video games, right? Like for that, that video game Tekken, which is like a fighting game. And it was this little website that made, you know, five or $10,000 a month. Um, I think I bought it for like 50,000 bucks or something, right? So you're like, oh, oh, wow. It was like, yeah. those numbers were crazy, right? You have to like go, but you know, figure out an auction and, and figure out what to do. So I, I, I just realized like, there's a lot better ways to spend money to drive a return than like investing in like venture capital. So um, basically that, you fell into that, you know, took my tech, tech, tech hat, my internet hat, and just started buying these like weird things that were like, you know, one, one thing I bought was like a used marketplace for tractors, right? It's called Bobcats for sale. And, uh, it, you know, it was making a few hundred bucks a month. And I think I bought it for like a thousand dollars, right? So I'm like, at some point, oh, I'm just wow. sitting here, like, let me, you know, see if I can buy enough of these things just to meet my like expenses. Lovely. Now I'm like, <laughs> not free, right? I can do whatever the heck I want. I can go line a beach somewhere. Um, it wasn't quite that easy, but I think it was like a, a I think I had the right, the right idea. Uh, maybe not the exact right execution. Cause like I, you know, I, I, I distinctly remember you can go to like my, my Amazon account. Like I bought this company and the same day I bought, I bought like WordPress for dummies, which is like a, you know, the content management system, like the bunch of the internet's run on. Cause I had no idea how to run these things. Right. So like, I'm just going to buy it and figure it out. And, and obviously that, that went as well as you'd expect, which is, you know, lost a bunch of money, but learned, learned a lot of stuff. Um, but that was kind of what I did. I just started buying these like little, you know, kind of mommy blogs and little sites and things like that and, and trying to aggregate them and generate cash flow. It's kind of like what I, what I did after leaving. Yeah. And just to explain that a little bit more, what do you like when you're purchasing, basically you're purchasing one website or one blog and then you have another blog and you want to put them together. And just explain that really. Yeah. Quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I, 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 we saw them, I saw them much more as um, individual businesses, right? So it's okay. saying, like, I'm going to buy a small business. This small business 
happens to use Google as his marketing channel. Uh, people show up when they want to, you know, buy a used tractor, apparently, right? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they if they click over, they'll go to eBay, they'll buy their tractor, I'll get a 10% commission and, and make money. So it's like a little standalone business. Sure. I okay. say, well, I list more tractors and some other products. Like, you know, was, I, I looked at thought it like it's like its own little ecosystem that I could kind of grow and play with. And, and then, you know, I, the ideal, you know, in my head, it was like, well, I'm going to build an assembly line, right? I'm going to go buy one, you know, you know fix it up you know, put it in the, put it in the pile of the back of my garage and then go do the next one. Right. And I probably did that four or five times in, in the span of like six months. And then you realize, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So, um, that was kind of my first exposure to buying businesses, like on my own, it was my first exposure to like running a, a company or a startup, whatever you're going to call it. So, um, it was a lot of, a lot of lessons. Um, but it, it was a fun one. Like, I think it was a, a good way to, again, be exposed to a lot of stuff. Right. Yeah, I mean, it just shows everyone, and I've heard about these where people buy boring businesses or whatever they are, and it kicks off a lot of cash flow and it limits it. Uh, it's not it's not as much work as people would think. But on this other thing, on the startup that you're on now, Matador, mm-hmm. this is not a boring business. <laughs> this yes. is slightly different than that. Tell me, how did this come to be? What it what is? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really funny. Um, so my last name is Sony. And I'm I'm Indian, like Indian origin. I was born in Chicago, but parents are Indian. And you know, you know, so Sony it, it, it means actually goldsmith. So it, it's basically oh, wow. my, my entire family, like back in India, they're all like jewelers and they work in the gold industry. So it's it's you know never thought to be in space, but like it just you know funny how life works. Um, but you know, even as a kid, right, my parents would like get me these like little gold chains or stuff like that for Christmas when other kids would get like a Nintendo. I'm like, what is this thing? Right. Like why, why do I yeah. have now a safe deposit box full of little pieces of gold? Right. Like this is, this sucks. Um, I, I want toys like everybody else. And um, you know, eventually you get older and you, you go back to the safe deposit box. You're like, this is like 12 ounces of the gold here. It's like real money. Right. It's like 50 grand or something. Um, like thank, thank you parents. Right. Um, but so yeah. it really kind of became interested in, you know, kind of goals and asset class, maybe just from like that legacy. Um, but uh, I've always been, you know, a bit of Pollyanna, like thinking the world's going to end. And, you know, uh, you know, maybe over the last 10 years, like, Mark, it's super value. This is crazy, right? Like, um, and, and you know, jokes on jokes on me for, for 10 years of, you know, great growth, right? Um, but, but, you know, I think just going back and be, me being a little bit of a historian on, um, you know, from a reading perspective, on just like the way the way the, way the world has worked, and you know what happens in in times of you know down downward pressure, downward economies. Um, you know, physical assets and things like that always just made a lot of sense. You know, gold as a store of value just made a lot of sense. And you know, looking at this thing, and you're like, okay, well, you know, over the last couple of years with COVID, with the war in the Ukraine, with you know the, the market crashing, you're sitting here going like. This is the time. Everybody told us the last thousand years that like gold is supposed to have like this run, right? And like, what's going on? Why is why is it not moving, right? It's like the the only thing in the last ten years that hasn't gone up, right? Um, and you know, started thinking more about it, and you had know, kind of been a, a you know dabbled in kind of crypto and Bitcoin blockchain for a while, and and I started you know thinking of the thesis that basically for a lot of younger people, especially you know, kind of Bitcoin and crypto is kind of taking that place of gold um, in in the the store of value uh, you know frame of mind. Um, and then, you know, we realized, like, hey, well, look, uh, like, you know, I think there's a, a, a misalignment here because um, the other interesting thing about, you know, kind of Bitcoin and almost every other common experience in the world is they've gotten way better over the last five or 10 years, right? You can go Absolutely. buy Bitcoin on PayPal or on Square in two clicks. You know, Robinhood exists. You can go buy shares of stock. You can buy a you know refrigerator and twelve easy payments and have it delivered to your door in fifteen minutes off of like an app, right? Whereas you know, go, me being you know again having a little bit of free capital, wanting to you know to buy gold, I'm like, how the heck do I do this? Do I have to go with like a duffel bag of cash to some pawn shop in a shady neighborhood? Do I you know you know go to like some 1970s checkout in Yahoo and buy some like you know, coins with some like old dead person's face on them with the golden, like where do I store them, right? There's this whole like rigmarole of trying to figure out how to do this effectively. And it's really there had to be a better way. Um, and, you know, in between sort of like uh, buying little businesses and, and, and kind of gold, I, I kind of helped start this company um, called, called uh, Polymath, with the whole goal of which was to basically, uh, you know, turn um, real world assets into, into securities and, and digitize them, right? So Real estate and oh, wow. things like that. So it's a company called Polymath. It's still you know around doing quite well today. But um, so it spent you know almost a, a year or two really mentally thinking about securities and and 
you know, digitization and liquidity and all this stuff. And I think it just really made natural sense for us uh, to, to basically the same folks I kind of started Polymath with to um, build a platform to make it easier to, to, to streamline kind of gold. Just thinking about the next couple of years, right? Like, I don't think anyone right now thinks the market's going to be up in the next three, six, 12 months, right? Everyone's like, uh, this is the next 10 years, or the next couple of years are going to be terrible, right? Real estate's down, you know, bonds are going down, everything's going down. And yet, you know, you have this like nice rally in gold. And I think uh, when you see inflation, you know, a lot of people think gold's going to go up 20, 30% next year. Who knows? I'm not an oracle, but, you, you know, whatever it is, like, I, I figured, now is a good time to build something that's going to streamline and facilitate it, which is really why we kind of decided to launch Matador was basically the tailwinds, you know, again, opportunities preparation, right? The tailwinds of, of kind of this, this crappy market are kind of the tailwinds and the opportunities, the fact that I've kind of worked in, you know, asset digitization, you know, kind of grew up in the gold space and all this stuff. So it just felt like a really, really natural way for me to kind of, um, you know, make a dent in people's like portfolios a little bit, hopefully for the positive. Yeah. And the more I've been researching it, it makes a ton of sense because when you think about it, you brought up a point where younger people are purchasing crypto, they're purchasing stocks. Like when I speak with uh, people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, and I tell them how I can just trade stocks, they're like, if they're not in touch with stocks and crypto and everything, they're like, what are you talking about? Don't you have to call you have to a call software? your broker like, on the phone, wait for like, yeah, exactly, right? Totally. And it's this whole new concept of like, when you think about it, people put the money in the 401k because that was the only place they could put it. People couldn't access crypto. Crypto, I spoke to a 17 year old who's like, yeah, I'm doing leverage crypto. I'm like, probably not the best idea, but you do you, man. But it's just fascinating because it allows people not to trade, but to learn about what's going on. So when you bring this up, and I'll just bring it up, it's basically a trading platform for gold and allows it through easy access of just connecting your bank like you do with everything else. That's fascinating. Because when I was a kid, I saw those gold bricks and I was like, that'd be so cool to own it. And then you start to put it all together and you're like, where am I going to put this thing? Where do I, do I store them in a closet? I don't have a secret room that I can hide all my gold in. Like, where not not cool enough this? to wear it around my neck just yet, but getting to that point. No. Right? <laughs> like, what, what are you going to do with it? And it's just, it, it, you bring up a very good point. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly, I mean, the reason why we kind of created Matter was to say, well, you know, I think a lot of people like the idea of holding gold and owning it and, you know, making it a, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, put your whole net worth into it, but, you know, like in the same way that people dollar cost average into, you know, kind of Bitcoin and stocks and, S and P five hundred, you know, it seems like a pretty sound way to, you know, me being a good data point of, of getting, you know, a few, a few bucks of gold every year when I was like five years old, and now it's like a it's a meaningful thing, right? I think you know, just doing that is is a, a great way to diversify, but it's it, you know, it's hard to do. So what we kind of wanted to do is say, look, well, if you really want to buy a kilogram gold brick or a or, you know something like that, well, now, now our app lets you kind of, if you think gold's going to 2000 bucks or 3000 bucks, you're like, well, I, I want to, you know, I don't have all the money for it now. Well, it lets you kind of basically pay for it over, you know, 12 or 15 payments and lock in the price today. So there's that there's, you know, we stored it. Oh, wow. So, you know, we stored at the Royal Mint in Canada, which is, you know, in, in our opinion, one of the, the most secure places in the world to, to store precious metals. A lot of governments store it there. And if you do, you know, want that gold brick to, to keep under your pillow or wearing a necklace or whatever, you can, you know, for two clicks, get it delivered to your house. You know, we try to make it as simple as possible to, um, and modern as possible. To, you know, it's kind of Robin Hood like UI, just to to streamline the whole the whole process. Wow! And uh, you just mentioned that you could purchase. So what's the price of gold at right now? Uh, it's roughly eighteen hundred dollars an ounce. I think I didn't check this morning, but okay. So if it's eighteen hundred, you think it's going to two thousand? You're telling me that you can buy the eighteen hundred over twelve months. Yeah, exa exactly. Wow. And yeah, so we basically, will, you know, we'll hold the gold on our balance sheet, you know, so the minute that you buy, you know, you, you put down a down payment, you call it between 20, 30% of the value, you know, we'll hold the whole thing on our balance sheet. So it's, it's there, it's your gold. The minute you pay for it, you know, you can, you can take delivery. Um, or if you, if you choose, you don't want it anymore, you break the contract, right? Like it's, it's a pretty neat product for people that, you know, it'd be cool if you're like, if you think, you know, in, in the same way that, 
and you know you think hey well i think you know pick your pick your stock uh you know facebook's, facebook's going back to 500 bucks i'd love to lock in a bunch of you know facebook now but i only have x cash right so it's kind of this uh way to do that um in, in a streamlined way um and, and you know we were able to do that in a way that's like very compliant like regulatory laws and stuff which is you know more complicated than, than one would think it's you know regulatory mm-hmm. stuff harder than it is sometimes i guess you know consumer protection and all but uh, that, that that was a lot more work than building the product, right? <laughs> you know, like, I could I could imagine, but the the reason I appreciate that is because I have seen people who are financing couches, who are financing um, yeah, 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 exactly. bedroom sets, and I'm like, God, we're financing a TV, and uh, if you finance your investment, not a bad play. It just means that you have to pay it every month, which means you're bound to invest it every single month. And it's just interesting how everything is on the monthly payment now. Yeah, well, it, it, well yeah. I mean, it, it's like a forced savings plan, right? I mean, versus Absolutely. versus a forced spending plan, where like I'm gonna go, uh, you know, put my spring break in in, in Cabo and, and all the bad tequila shots on, you know, spring break, and I'm paying for it a year later in, in many ways, right? Um, here, you actually paying, you made a decision maybe when you were drunk or maybe when you were, you know, sober, <laughs> buying some gold, but at least you're it's forcing you to save save money every month, right? Yeah. And one of the things that people don't realize is that when you purchase a property, that's a forced savings mechanism as well. Like when you're paying off that mortgage, people think, oh, I have to pay this amount every single month or I need a rent or I needed this. The reason the house is, is older people's biggest asset is because it's a forced savings mechanism. That, it's the 401k so is a forced savings. Yeah. yeah. And people don't realize that these forced savings mechanisms are the way because inherently we're humans and we're not that disciplined it's hard to be disciplined no you look at your 70 years old right and like what are you going to end up with you're going to end up with your, your house your your 401k your social security plan all these things are for savings plans right absolutely and if gold could be another part of that why not and i mean two thousand dollars if you think about it you're putting 20 30 percent down probably putting in like five six hundred bucks that's a little high but and then you're paying a hundred bucks a month. It's really interesting. Really, really interesting. Yeah, especially in a market where, um, right, you, you know, there, there, it almost seems like there's no good opportunities, right? It's like, well, I'm going to sit in stocks, but maybe those are going to go down 20% this year. You know, cash is being inflated away at five or 10% a year. You know, real estate might go down 20%, which is a lever play. So it's kind of like, what, what do I do right now? It's very, it can be crippling. Uh, so, you know, we're not, we're not saying, hey, like, go all in a gold or anything, but it seems like a good place to at least uh, start uh, diversifying away from, you know, all, all the stuff that's not working in this market. Absolutely. And why do you think that gold never got that modernization that pretty much a lot of other assets did get? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think part of it, is sort of that luster of, of, of blockchain really took a lot of that public attention, a lot of the, 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 the minds in the space gravitated towards that and, and kind of finance and things like that. Um, so I, I would say that's a part of it. I, I mean, I think there's this whole, um, you know, Warren Buffett's like knock on gold, right? Is that, well, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Uh, it just kind of sits there and what do you do? You like, you know, make a big pile of it and you sit on it, right? Um, but, but in a, in a, you know, the nice thing about it is, is, you know, they're not making that much more of it, right? Like either, you, people generally know how much reserves there are. Um, it's, you know, not getting depleted away. It's not, a, you know, so like, I feel like there, there are a lot of benefits to having something safe and stable in a market where, you, you know, like it, it feels stable today, but who knows? There's like lots of things that can kind of go wrong still in the world, right? There are, you, you're at the knife on, you know, nuclear war in the Ukraine or, you know, another pandemic, uh, you know, the economy tanking further, right? Like all these things are, are I feel like they're on a precipice. If they go the wrong way, having something where at least it, it's worth what you put in but before is a pretty, pretty nice feeling. And that's kind of the way we feel about kind of gold in this market. Yeah. Um, and I completely agree with your sentiment there regarding that a lot of the blockchain and crypto people have jumped on that wagon and developed projects in that wagon instead of gold getting that respect because gold's been here for forever it's been here so long and it was usually a thing well i think kind of is interesting that this idea of just paying for stuff ourselves never really was open because banks wanted to keep it in their in their pockets pretty much and then the crypto people were like no we can do this and it kind of forced the uh institute financial institutions 
to go, oh, you can do trades for free. You can do it because everyone's just trying to beat each other. Yep. So I think that's, it, it's a cool opportunity. Yeah, thanks to we're excited. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's, again, it's, it feels like we're in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, we've got to build this wait list. We're, we're launching in a couple of weeks. We built a list. It looks like, you know, 10,000 users are just kind of waiting for us to get on. And I mean, we're excited. We're excited about the business. We're excited about, uh, you know, the, the future, despite the, you know, the dire stuff we're talking about today, I guess. But. Absolutely. So where does the goal, so you guys are staying, keeping it at the Royal Mint. And then do you have, how does it work with the gold circulation? Are you guys like have a ton? Like, how does all that work? Sure. Um, so we always keep um, a reserve of gold like on our balance sheet. And as customers buy it, we basically swap it to this kind of like trust style account that really is on behalf of the customers. So we always, you know, we, we, you know, we don't want to get ahead of our skis in the sense of saying, well, you know, we don't all this gold. We've got to go buy it. When you buy it, we actually always have a balance. We always have a balance of, you know, sort of six figures of gold in, in, a, in on top of what, you know, customer reserves are. So every time someone makes a purchase, we'll actually go, you know, with, with our direct API, just go buy more gold, but we've always got a balance. And then every time, you know, someone sells, it's the same thing, right? We move it into our account, we sell it, and then uh, it, it kind of works that way. So, but if it's always, you know, stored in custody at the Mint, which, you know, in our perspective, from our research is like the safest place in, in the world to, to hold gold. Awesome. So where, when is this going to go live? What, what countries is it in? Because I understand there's regulation all over the place, so it's difficult. Right, right. Absolutely. So um, we're probably going to be launching the first week of, of January um, and, you know, launching Canada first and fast following the U.S. Um, the U.S. is a little trickier because it's like state by state regulation. So it's like, sure, we could open up in you know New York and Wisconsin today. And like, you know, like, what's the point? But so I think we're really aiming to get all those state by state you know, requirements down in the next coming weeks so we can kind of kick off in the U.S. just as quickly. When are you looking at doing the U.S.? Time uh, hope, hoping kind of first bit like you know March February March. We'll, we'll oh wow, this is very quick. This is exciting. No, yeah, this is cool. No, I, yeah, we'll see. This is one of my favorite parts about the podcast is that you have these uh, some startups that come on and you hear about what's coming in the future, and you're like, yes, it is a scary time right now, but like the future is bright. Like there is a lot of exciting stuff coming. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I think I, even even when I like look at young people these days who are like, way younger than I am, like there's a lot of people doing cool stuff. It's great. Like I feel, I feel like everyone, no one, you know, it's like the human condition. You always gotta, you guys gotta do more. Yeah, absolutely. So um, quick with you, Devin, before we uh, shut this down, what is it? The fact that you brought up cool stuff that sounds to be a trend through your entire life that you've done. You've been in rooms that you shouldn't have been. You're working on projects that are just mind blowing. How do you find these projects? How do you go about that instead of being trapped in the mundane? You know what I mean? Because there's so many people trapped in that life and it's difficult. But how, how do you think about like kind of opening up and doing your own thing? No, it it's a great question. Do your own thing. It's a cool project. So. I'm, I'm going to make sure not to you know, send this part to, 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 my, to my wife, so to speak. But like it's always, you know, it's always being a little un, unsatisfied with the status quo, right? It's just like, there has to be more out there. There has to be something different. Um, if, if I, you know, wake up too many days, just not feeling, you know, inspired or motivated, then then I feel like I'm spending, you know, kind of my, my limited time on this earth in like the wrong way. Um, and if, I, you know, I'd rather be almost, almost, I'd almost rather be doing nothing than something I, I don't like. And, you know, and that's kind of part of the last, you know, working so hard in my, you know, 20s and 30s was to be able to be at a point where I could just kind of sit around if I wanted to. So, you know, the bar is pretty high, um, which I think is, which is an interesting one. Um, but the other side of it is, I think, just um, having such a disparate network of people and, and you know, reading material and podcasts, like, just, you know, I think the, the world right now, you see, if you were, like, sitting in the 1800s right now, right, you'd be like, if you wanted to go be successful, you, you wouldn't have to think that hard. You're like, I'm just going to go build a bigger farm, right, or, or, you know, like, launch a factory to make soap, right? Whereas now I think the world is so competitive. I think you almost need these like collisions and, and, and you know, overlaps and Venn diagrams to figure out the right opportunities. So I think, um, you know, for me, it's been having one to hold in crypto and one to hold in, you know, boring businesses and, you know, one, one foothold in, um, you know, investment banking. Like I think the, the, all these kind of collisions just create for, for me, you know, I kind of, kind of see the world, the, what the world should be like in a you know, few months or a few years and try to, if it's not there, just try to, you know, be, be the change, so to speak. 
Love that. Yeah, you got to build your own path. And if it's not the conventional one, then you build. And I love how you treat it as like, yeah, this was my first couple of years. This was the next. This was the next. And it's kind of your it's your path. It's whatever you want it to be. Um, so, Devin, where can people learn more about Matador? Where can they learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bymatador.com is our domain name. Um, I'm in between Twitter accounts right now, but my, the new one will be up pretty soon on Matador. But, uh, you know, the easiest way to reach out and just throw an email out there is, is Devin at Matador.network. Um, we've also, yeah, and, you know, bymatador.com is the domain, but uh, that's where, you know, a lot of the cool stuff we do. We've got a really neat newsletter on, on all things, kind of goals and investing in this market. So probably a decent place to, to hang out as well if you want some, uh, you know, a, another area to, to kind of just uh, to, to look into and learn from. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you explaining this and taking the time. And I wish you guys a, a very successful launch. Great. Thank you so much. Really, really enjoyed this. Thank you for reaching the end of the podcast. For that, we'll give you a complimentary coaching session in the link below with Edwards Consulting. Hope to see you there and have a great day and keep clocking in.